Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is November 21, 1977, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 28. In the closing moments of AUDIO LETTER No. 22 for March 1977, I warned you that, quote, the elaborate war plan which I revealed in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6 for November 1975 is being revised and updated for application in the present circumstances. Certain of my sources have expressed great concern to me recently that a provocation for war in the Middle East is now being established that will be unlike anything we have ever seen before." Unquote. And then I added, quote, To achieve that purpose plans are being seriously considered which, if carried out, could instantly throw all three major religions of the Western world into turmoil in the course of igniting a Middle East conflict. My hope is that by warning you of the existence of such plans, I am making them too dangerous for the conspirators to carry out. But in case they are carried out, I hope that you will now be able to recognize it immediately when it happens. End of quotation from AUDIO LETTER No. 22. As I speak these words today, eight months later, the eyes of the world are suddenly focused on the Middle East as never before. The stalemate of Middle East peace negotiations has, in a week's time, been shattered in a spectacular way, and something unheard of is unfolding before our very eyes. After 29 years of hostility and wars, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt left Jerusalem today where he talked of peace face to face with Israeli leaders and to address the Israeli Parliament. All other diplomatic efforts to bring peace in that region have been thrown aside by Sadat's unexpected mission to Israel, but already Sadat finds himself almost totally isolated in the Arab world, supported only by Tunisia and Morocco. All this, my friends, is only the beginning. The plan to plunge the Middle East into war as the first step toward Nuclear War I has now been set in motion, and Sadat's trip is intended to be nothing more than a major step towards fulfillment of this plan. It is now almost two months since America's disastrous defeat in the still secret battle of the Harvest Moon, history's first space battle on September 27, 1977. Since that time, our rulers have been trying for the very first time in their lives to deal with a situation in which they no longer have a hidden whip with which to make the Soviet Union cooperate with them but they are not doing the one thing which would have at least a chance of preventing nuclear war, and that is total official worldwide exposure of the present Soviet war threat as it affects not only the United States but also many other countries. Instead, they are falling back on the techniques of maneuver, deception, and double-cross. Now that they have lost control of the Soviet Union, the Rockefeller brothers are discovering that their survival is tied to our national survival after all. But instead of letting us in on what we now face, their controlled CIA and other agents are trying to find some way to maneuver out of the Russian bear trap, stalling for time while still keeping us in the dark. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, A House Divided Against Itself Over Salt. Topic No. 2, The Exchange of Soviet and American Threats. And Topic No. 3, The Sadat Trip to Israel and Nuclear War I. Topic No. 1, In 1961, Two major programs were started in parallel by the controlled government of the United States. One was America's crash program to go to the moon, announced by President Kennedy in May of that year. The other was the program to disarm America in stages, 
signaled by the creation of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in September of that same year, 1961. Neither the Moon Project nor the disarmament program was what it seemed on the surface, and while they were made to seem unrelated, they were actually two arms of a single military strategy for dictatorship over the United States and finally over the world. It is this diabolical strategy that has finally jumped the tracks, leaving not only the United States but also our hidden rulers in a desperate situation. The strategy which began to be implemented in 1961 was a very complex one, but its underlying concept is as simple as it is astonishing. Basically our rulers were in effect going underground with all the most important new military developments while gradually stripping us of our existing, better-known military capabilities. In the process, our constitutional military services, that is, those which are required by law to serve you and me, have been gradually downgraded, weakened, and demoralized, but behind the scenes, unhampered by legal or moral constraints, Ever more advanced weapons have been created for the exclusive benefit of our secret rulers without any hint of their existence to the public or to Congress. Thus, as I first revealed ten months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 20, the controlled CIA has secretly become the most powerful military agency in the United States in total violation of its charter and the United States Constitution. The centerpiece of this 16-year-old program of developing totally secret weapons was our Moon program. In AUDIO LETTER No. 26 two months ago I told you the full story about our Moon project, which from the start had a military purpose and which ended in disaster just two months ago on September 27, 1977, but there were many other aspects to this program as well. For example, in recent years the American public have become accustomed to publicly acknowledged weapons programs, costing vast sums that seem out of all proportion to what the weapons are worth. These cost overruns, my friends, are due not only to mismanagement and waste, they are also a means of financing secret projects by burying their costs in the bloated budgets of publicly known programs. As for the weapons themselves that we are publicly told about today, it's almost as if innovation and progress had suddenly stopped in 1961, aside from marginal improvements here and there. When we hear about nuclear ballistic missile submarines, for example, how many people stop to think how long it has been since they made their appearance? The first atomic submarine, the USS Nautilus, was launched nearly a quarter century ago in 1954 and was a spectacular advance over the diesel and battery-powered boats of World War II. Only five years later but now nearly 20 years ago came the next spectacular advance, the Ballistic Missile Submarine, beginning with the George Washington in 1959. At about the same time the public was given a hint of things to come. When films were made public showing the periscope of a research submarine outrunning a speeding Coast Guard cutter with ease. But starting in 1961, public attention to the possibilities of major future advances began to be avoided. In the same way, the 16 years from 1945 to 1961 saw spectacular steady advancement in military aircraft capabilities. In 1945 our first-line fighters and bombers were propeller-driven. Jets were still largely experimental, and most people took it for granted that there was a sound barrier that could not be cracked. But a mere ten years later jet bombers and fighters ruled the air, and supersonic travel was a reality. 
In 1956 the F-104 was introduced with a top speed of two and a half times the speed of sound, roughly the same as the newest American fighters today. We hear all about the wonderful cruise missile, but we are not supposed to remember another kind of cruise missile of a decade ago cancelled by then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Called Pluto, it was to be nuclear-powered, able to circle the Earth several times over and strike an enemy from any direction at extremely low altitudes and supersonic speeds. And while we content ourselves with fatiguing 20-year-old slow B-52s, we're not supposed to remember that in the early 60's the B-70 was already flying at three times the speed of sound. By now most Americans have all but forgotten about these fast-moving developments of yesteryear. Many of these lie far beyond any technology which is publicly admitted to be in use today, and they provide a dim hint of the secret weapons developments that have actually taken place without our consent and not for our good. Only the most spectacular, huge program of them all, the Moon program, was made public simply because there was no other way to do it. As I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, secrecy was maintained by not letting us in on the purpose of the Moon program, bathing the program otherwise in great publicity. Originally the plan was for the United States to be decimated in NUCLEAR WAR ONE as part of a larger plot for world control, but now the secret America moon base in Copernicus Crater has been put out of action. The Russians are now on the moon, furiously at work. The Soviet Union is the exclusive possessor of the awesome new particle beam weapon which is being used to blow our spy satellites out of the sky and all but two of the secret CIA undersea super missiles which were planted by Glomar Explorer and other means have sprung leaks and become useless. For the very first time the Soviet Union is in the driver's seat militarily, and America's secret rulers are in disarray over what to do. Last month I exposed the events leading to the Carter Administration's surrender to the Soviet Union on October 14, 1977 in the face of a deadly Soviet submarine threat against our country. The terms of this surrender require quick acceptance by us of a SALT II agreement which will begin the final total disarming of America. But once we are disarmed, the intention of the Kremlin's leaders is to ultimately strike the United States in a devastating military blow anyway. The more fully we can be disarmed beforehand, the less suffering will have to be endured by Russia as the price of destroying America for all time. To grasp the Soviet thinking about all of this, one must begin by understanding one key but little known fact. The Kremlin is no longer ruled today by the Bolshevik Communists whose November 1917 revolution was celebrated this month. The Soviet inner circle today are Communists, but of a very different breed from Lenin and his Bolsheviks. They were atheistic Communists, whereas the ruling group today would be better described as self-styled spiritual Communists. And while the Bolsheviks drew upon international support and were dominated by international interests, the Kremlin rulers of today are strongly nationalistic. They are determined that Soviet Russia, not just international Communism for its own sake, shall rule the world. When Alexander Solzhenitsyn left the Soviet Union in exile, he first had to sign a document in which he indicated that he still believed in Communism, meaning spiritual Communism, in which the Communist government would be under the control of the Church. When he sent this letter to the Kremlin, it was accepted and he was allowed to go. Solzhenitsyn today champions the reformation of the Soviet Marxist government, 
but this reformation is not intended to break down the present Soviet power structure. Indeed, Solzhenitsyn has said while predicting the imminent fall of the West that he expects to be back in Russia within just a few years' time. The takeover of the new ruling faction from the Bolsheviks began with the death of Joseph Stalin on March 5, 1953. This faction of Marxists working within Russia had allied themselves with the Bolsheviks in 1917, thereby guaranteeing the success of the Bolshevik Revolution. But even though the Bolsheviks and the self-styled spiritual Communists agreed on the concept of Communism as the proper form of government, the spiritual Communists retained their separate identity and worked toward the day when they would be able to seize total control for themselves. That day arrived when Stalin died, March 5, 1953. The following day Georgi Malenkov, the brother-in-law of Nikita Khrushchev, became Soviet Premier. When he was succeeded two years later on February 8, 1955, by Nikolai Bulganin, the transition was peaceful without bloodshed. A year later Khrushchev, as first Secretary of the Communist Party, launched his famous campaign to de-Stalinize Russia. Khrushchev himself had been an accessory to brutal purges on behalf of the Stalinist state, but when he replaced Bulganin as Premier on March 27, 1958, the transition once again was peaceful. Bulganin had resigned. On October 15, 1964, Leonid Brezhnev replaced Khrushchev as first Secretary of the Communist Party, and Alexei Kosygin became Premier. Khrushchev was in deep trouble because of his failure in the Cuban Missile Crisis and some other sharp reversals of his policies. But even Khrushchev was not liquidated in the old Bolshevik tradition of bloody power struggles. Instead, he was simply pushed aside and allowed to live in quiet retirement, writing his memoirs and receiving his pension. Power struggles in the Kremlin for the past quarter century have been devoid of the bloody infighting that was typical of the Bolsheviks. The new breed in the Kremlin today can be as brutal as anyone with their enemies or with those who rise up against their rule as proven in Hungary in 1956 and in Czechoslovakia in 1968. But among themselves there is a degree of tight-knit mutual respect that would have been inconceivable in the old Bolshevik days. They are united in their religion of spiritual Communism and in their hatred for the international forces with whom they have been forced to cooperate for so long. My friends, the international forces which are controlled today by the four Rockefeller Brothers is motivated primarily by greed and lust for power, but the self-styled spiritual Communists who control the Kremlin today look upon their goal of communizing the world from an added perspective. While they strive for power and total control, they are motivated by the zeal of saving their own souls. Like the Christian Crusaders of centuries ago who sought to evangelize the world at the point of a sword, the Kremlin of today intends to impose its system on all of us with the dedication, steadfastness, and determination of the true believer. In their view, any amount of suffering and brutality is justified so long as it leads toward the final goal of world spiritual Communism under Soviet domination. This change in the makeup of the Kremlin has never been fully understood or appreciated by those who dominate our government behind the scenes. And confronted as they are by the unified, determined stance of the Kremlin, they are responding with indecision divisions within their own ranks and desperate maneuverings. The real divisions that now exist within the ruling circles of this country 
are being compounded by some of these maneuvers, which are intended to stall for time without arousing Soviet suspicions. As a result, as the United States faces the worst threat in its history, we see in our own country a house divided against itself. Some saying SALT II is wonderful, others saying it is dangerous, still others daring to tell the public a few words about the agreement that will seal our fate, yet others declaring in total ignorance that SALT II is a good thing and that its critics should be investigated. Some of the controversy is real, some manipulated, but most of the spokesmen on the political scene regardless of their SALT viewpoint, are tied to the one Rockefeller International Party that rules not only North America but Europe and Japan as well, the Trilateral Commission headed by one David Rockefeller. Last month I described the growing euphoria over the certainty of a SALT II agreement, but even as I recorded that tape, the multi-pronged controversy over SALT II was increasing. On November 1, news reports suddenly said snags had cropped up in the SALT II talks. A former arms control negotiator was quoted as saying, I believe we are locked into inferiority and I don't know how to get out of it." Unquote. The next day, November 2, Leonid Brezhnev proposed in a speech that all nuclear explosions be banned, including peaceful and underwater explosions. His mention of underwater explosions was actually a veiled threat, urging the Carter Administration to get on with it in selling the SALT II surrender to Congress and the American public. Secretary of State Cyrus Vance immediately hailed Brezhnev's statement as a great thing, adding, quote, there has been an improvement and the relationship between ourselves and the Soviet Union in the last several weeks." Unquote. Two days later, on November 4, Vance was totally unprepared to back up his answers about SALT details in a closed-door Senate hearing. The reason is that the Administration is preparing to go around Congress to conclude a SALT II agreement with Moscow by executive order. The SALT II contract will actually contain United States capitulation terms. Meanwhile, Congress is being used as much as possible to raise a smoke screen of controversy to provide an excuse to buy time. Three days later, on November 7, a fresh campaign began to reassure the Kremlin that the agreement of October 14 to accept the disarming of America by SALT II is still on track. Political attacks were unleashed against SALT critics for allegedly leaking information to the public that might jeopardize SALT II. Meanwhile, the 60th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution was being celebrated in Moscow with the biggest military parade through Red Square ever, and while Soviet President Brezhnev talked détente, his Defense Minister delivered a speech so belligerent that it left many Western observers shaken and bewildered. To continue soothing the Russian bear, Jimmy Carter said on November the 11th, quote, My prediction is we will have a SALT agreement. There will be a SALT II. We will immediately continue with a SALT III, unquote. In this he was parroting the Kremlin line, echoing Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin who predicted that same day that there will be a SALT agreement before the end of the year. But the divided House of America's Government continued to careen along out of control. Only two days after these reassuring public words to the Kremlin by Carter, officials of his own administration said that it would probably be another three to six months before SALT II became a reality. The same day Senate Minority Leader Howard Baker told the press that SALT II, quote, is in trouble now." Unquote. Soviet exasperation has been building rapidly at the on-again, off-again political game-playing over SALT II. Only last month 
the Soviet Union backed off from a nuclear strike against the United States in response to a capitulation by the Carter Administration on October 14. The Russians can recognize Stalin when they see it, and they wasted no time in flexing their own military muscle this month to make the Carter Administration knuckle under again. Topic No. 2 In AUDIO LETTER No. 24 FOR MAY 1977, SIX MONTHS AGO, I REVEALED THE BEGINNING OF A SOVIET PROGRAM OF PREPARING FOR GEOPHYSICAL WARFARE, WITH HUGE NUCLEAR BOMBS PLANTED AT STRATEGIC LOCATIONS UNDER THE SEA TO PRODUCE ARTIFICIAL EARTHQUAKES AND TIDAL WAVES. IN AUDIO LETTER No. 25 FOR AUGUST, I also gave the coordinates of ten new bombs, cobalt bombs, that had been planted in addition to the seven super bombs lurking around the Philippine Islands. Since that time, dozens of additional undersea bombs have been planted worldwide, and several have been set off. The strength of the quake that is triggered by setting off such a bomb can vary somewhat, depending on the stresses that already exist in the Earth's crust at that location and other factors, but in many cases the shock strength turns out to be about 6.5 on the Richter scale, strong enough to do major damage if it were on land. As a result, there have been a considerable number of undersea quakes of strength around 6.5 reported lately, yet the news media never comment on how strange it is that so many quakes are happening with virtually the same strength. The most remarkable case of media silence about the similar strength of so many quakes took place on September 4, 1977, two and a half months ago. On that day the Soviet Union set off four of their undersea bombs in the Pacific, one at the north end of the New Hebrides Trench northeast of Australia and three in the Aleutian Trench thousands of miles to the north. The three main quakes that were produced in the Aleutians had Richter scale readings of 6.5, 6.6, and 6.5 respectively. The one in the New Hebrides was slightly stronger with a reading of 6.8. These facts were reported in the news, but no one ventured a word about the similar strength of all these major quakes. On November 2, Leonid Brezhnev mentioned in a speech his hope that all nuclear explosions, including underwater explosions, could be terminated, but the political stalling tactics against SALT II were just getting underway, and two days later the Kremlin set off another undersea bomb in the Aleutians to remind the Carter Administration of what they can do. The result was an undersea quake near the island of Adak, and as usual the reported strength of the shock was 6.5 on the Richter scale. Two days later, impatient with Carter Administration performance in pushing through acceptance of the SALT II proposals to disarm America, the Kremlin raised the stakes. Shortly after midnight Sunday, November 6, 1977, Jimmy Carter's home state of Georgia became the target for another demonstration of what the Kremlin plans for those who stand in their way. A button was pushed, and a small nuclear mine that had been planted just upstream of the Toccoa Falls Dam in northern Georgia was detonated. Torrential rains in the area were just ending, but as usual the dam showed no sign that anything was wrong. A year earlier the same dam had experienced such heavy rainfall that water spilled over the top. This had caused the creek in the valley 200 feet below to overflow its banks, but the dam itself had suffered no damage. For 40 years the Tacoa Dam had served its purpose without incident, and a visual inspection just three days earlier had revealed nothing wrong. But when the Soviet mine was set off, the dam collapsed instantly. The blast from the mine momentarily parted the waters of Kelly Barnes Lake, throwing a wave of water downstream with the dam, 
and momentarily backing up the water upstream of the mine. Then the bulk of the lake rushed out through the huge breach in the dam, hurtled over 200-foot high Tacoa Falls, and rushed into the valley below. A double wave of water swept through the Bible College campus below, a smaller initial wave followed by the main body of water. A three-mile-long swath was devastated, and 38 people died, half of them children. The Tekoa Dam disaster came in the wake of deepening worry over the continued Soviet particle beam attacks on our spy satellites. Within hours Jimmy Carter postponed his planned trip abroad, telling us that the reason was to push Congress toward adoption of his so-called Energy Bill. Three days after the Tekoa disaster on November 9, United States Ambassador Malcolm Toon met at his request with Soviet President Brezhnev in the Kremlin for over an hour, delivering an urgent letter from Carter. No details were released about the letter, but Carter was making two basic requests. One, that the Soviet Union cease and desist from destroying American surveillance satellites, and two, that Brezhnev and Carter meet at the earliest possible moment. But Brezhnev gave Carter no encouragement about a meeting until after a salt to accord is reached, and he drummed away at the urgency of finalizing the agreement dictated by the Kremlin. In other words, the Soviets do not intend to tolerate stalling by the Carter Administration. The same day, November 9, 1977, events were set in motion that are intended to unleash a Middle East war, and in its wake Nuclear War One. I'll tell you more about that in Topic No. 3. On November 12, Soviet pressure on the Carter Administration was raised a notch higher. In Erie, South Korea, a railroad yard was suddenly laid waste by a tremendous explosion. Scores were killed outright. Over a thousand people were injured. Nearly 10,000 homes and buildings were destroyed and over 14,000 people were suddenly homeless. That blast was heard over 10 miles away. Soviet agents had planned for a railroad car full of dynamite to be in the blast area to provide a cover story for public consumption, but South Korean analysts who arrived on the scene knew right away that this was no ordinary dynamite blast. An explosive sitting on the surface, like the carload of dynamite, produces an extremely wide, shallow crater, but in the Erie disaster not one but two distinct craters were produced, with an area of overlap between them. Furthermore, each crater was extremely deep compared to its width, one of them 49 feet deep, the other 65 feet deep and although 30 tons of dynamite produces a very violent blast indeed, each crater corresponds to an explosive force perhaps 100 times that powerful. According to high intelligence sources, Soviet agents are known to have buried two clean nuclear mines in the area where the blast occurred. They were placed side by side, about 100 feet apart, to do maximum damage to the network of railroad tracks. Each had a yield of several kilotons, a fraction of the yield of the Hiroshima bomb, and on November 12, 1977, they were detonated simultaneously. It was a disaster for South Korea, and another shocking warning to the Carter Administration that the Soviet Union is not to be trifled with. And when Brezhnev speaks of the urgency of finalizing the SALT II agreement, he means we are on a short fuse and that he will not be patient for very long. The Carter Administration is being backed into a corner so rapidly by the Kremlin that an abortive decision was made earlier this month to pull out all the stops for a preemptive war against the Soviet Union. This idea was to let the chips fall where they may while we do still have some military might left. But as of two days ago, November 19, the Soviet Union has already squelched this plan, and the war now brewing is back on track.
to be, as Gromyko said to Carter on September 27, 1977, on Soviet terms. The letter from Carter delivered to Brezhnev on November 9 received no immediate reply. Instead, the blast in South Korea signaled that the Kremlin was growing still more impatient for the SALT II approval process to get off dead center, and more of our satellites have been blasted this month by Soviet Cosmos interceptors wielding particle beams. By November 18, three days ago, there still had been no direct answer, and on that day the Voice of America was used to hurl a thinly veiled threat at Moscow. Every nation uses its national radio as a tool of propaganda and electronic diplomacy, the United States included. Every message that is broadcast by the Voice of America is heavily censored, edited, analyzed, and picked apart to make sure that every word says what the United States Government once said. Bearing in mind that our satellite warning systems are now being destroyed by Soviet killer satellites, listen carefully to these words from the Voice of America broadcast of November 18, 1977, and I quote, The White House has warned that the deployment of these so-called killer satellites could increase the chances of a first strike in space." Unquote. And quote, the obviously destabilizing danger of satellite warfare is that with its observation satellites put out of commission, a nation would lose a major portion of its warning system and might then consider preemptive war." Unquote. In diplomatic language, these words amounted to a very clear threat by the United States to attack the Soviet Union if no satisfaction is received concerning our vanishing spy satellites. On the afternoon of that same day, November 18, Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrydin delivered a message from Brezhnev to Carter at the White House. The message made it clear that Washington is in no position to dictate anything to the Kremlin now that the SALT approval process in the United States is becoming ever more, quote, urgent, unquote, and that the Soviet President would regret being forced to take any measures that might run counter to the recent improvement in relations between the two nations. The full impact of Brezhnev's last comment reached the White House at roughly that same time as the Brezhnev message itself. The NATO underwater sonar nets around Iceland had picked up the Soviet Atlantic Submarine Fleet, which, as happened six weeks ago, was heading en masse into the Atlantic at great speed. At the same time, the huge Soviet Pacific Submarine Fleet was also on its way toward the United States, and the Gulf Fleet was already moving into position to threaten us from the south. Even before the Voice of America broadcast, the Kremlin knew that the Carter Administration response to increasing Soviet pressure over SALT could possibly be some kind of bluff and possibly panic as well. So the Soviet Navy had been dispatched in order to ensure that nothing would get out of hand, and when government officials here learned that the Soviet fleet was on its way here again, they promptly wilted. Shades of Kerensky. As of now, they are once again concentrated on doing as they are told by the Soviet Union, and both the Pacific and Atlantic fleets have headed back toward port, but the Soviet Gulf Fleet has not left. It is staying on station for the moment, ready for attack at a moment's notice from our soft underbelly to the south. This is Moscow's way of discouraging the Carter Administration from attempting any more bluffs or hasty actions that might upset America's program march into final disaster. Topic No. 3 AUDIO LETTER No. 22 in which I warned about a horrendous new plan to provoke a Middle East war was recorded on March 27, 1977. Exactly one week later, on April 3, 1977, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt arrived in Washington for talks with President Carter, and the first phase of the CIA Middle East plot got underway. Sadat had in the past been asked from time to time by reporters 
whether face-to-face -face negotiations directly between the Arabs and Israelis might be useful. He had always rejected this out of hand, and when asked the same question on April 6, responded in the same way. He said that after 29 years of hatred and four wars, the Arabs were not yet ready for such a drastic step. But during his visit here Sadat was subjected to the psychological programming techniques which I revealed over two years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 5 for October 1975. These techniques can be used to alter a person's brain wave pattern and inject thoughts and tendencies that differ from their normal thinking. As I told you then, a world leader can be programmed to change his policies, and that is what happened to Sadat. During his visit here last April, a single thought was planted in Sadat's mind, namely to go directly to Israel to negotiate. It was a thought totally foreign to Sadat, but ever since his visit here it has been in his mind constantly, and he has been unable to shake it. While Sadat was here on April 7, Prime Minister Rabin of Israel resigned. Supposedly he was ensnared in a financial scandal, but actually he had learned of the plot to bring on a war and he wanted no part of it. Rabin's departure from the scene slowed down this plan. While a new Prime Minister was elected, it was Menachem Begin. He had to form a government and establish himself on the world stage. But now the fuse had been lit that is intended to make the Middle East explode into war. On November 9, reacting to the stimulus implanted in his mind, Sadat startled everyone by saying he would be willing to go anywhere, even Jerusalem, to seek peace. Only five days later, Television interviews of Sadat and Begin by Walter Cronkite of CBS and others set the stage for Sadat's trip to Israel. Sadat's decision to go to Israel was so abrupt that it produced a sharp contrast between Sadat's actions and those of his own Foreign Minister, Fahmi. While Sadat was on television with Walter Cronkite, Fahmi was in Tunisia at a meeting of Arab Foreign Ministers trying to rally all the Arabs to a united front in peace negotiations with Israel. Three days later Sadat announced his acceptance of the invitation he had solicited from Israel, and Fahmi resigned. For Sadat, the earliest possible moment for the trip was hardly soon enough, because he was now under a psychological compulsion to make the trip. Begin invited Sadat to Israel on or after November 21 but Sadat answered that he would arrive on the 19th, which he did. Now in spite of the best of intentions, Sadat has been used as a tool of the CIA to narrow the focus of Middle East peace negotiations to the outcome of the sadat begin discussions. It is now a much easier matter than before to torpedo peace in the Middle East, and that is what is planned. The Sadat Peace Initiative to Israel is supposed to be, unknown to Sadat himself, the first step toward war. Meanwhile, the framework for a war to accomplish the objectives described two years ago in my AUDIO LETTER No. 6 is being established all around us. The American team in the Sinai, put there supposedly to act as a buffer between Israel and Egypt, is still there having quietly swollen to a force more than a thousand strong, armed with F-15s and nuclear weapons. Cautious Saudi Arabia has been drawn into making statements recently in support of the Arab cause that will serve as a sufficient excuse for Saudi Arabia to be included in the nuclear strike against Arab OPEC oil wells that is planned when war comes. Meanwhile, we have been seeing the cover stories in the news about possible acquisition by Israel of large amounts of nuclear materials from America in recent years, planting the idea that Israel has, quote, the bomb, unquote. The triggering of the Sadat trip to Israel and the extremely rapid pace of events must be considered in light of the equally sudden visit to Washington by the Shah of Iran on November 14. This was the same day that Sadat and Begin committed themselves to a face-to-face -face meeting during interviews on television. On the 16th the Shah left the United States 
and on that day Tehran radio broadcast that there is, quote, total United States commitment to come to Iran's aid in the event of an emergency." Unquote. Iran is positioned on the soft underbelly of the Soviet Union, and it bristles with advanced American weaponry. Two days later the Voice of America broadcast its war threat against Moscow, which I quoted earlier, but the chess players in the Kremlin had already gotten the message, and the Soviet fleet was already at sea by then. As a result, any active threat Russia may be facing from Iran on its southern flank is offset by an active threat on our own southern flank in the form of submarines on station in the Gulf of Mexico. Thus, while the remnants of the United States Government are maneuvering to try to salvage some benefit for themselves from the coming war, the Kremlin is matching every move with counteractive measures designed to maintain their commanding military position. And every day that is wasted by not revealing the truth of these events works to the benefit of the Soviet Union, and that the Soviet Union is consolidating its newly dominant position still further. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 27 last month, Soviet cosmonauts had established an initial base of operations in Jules Verne Crater on the back side of the moon. However, it was expected at that time that after preliminary preparations they would very shortly be moving both equipment and personnel to the near side, setting up an operational particle beam weapon almost immediately when they did so. On October 30, the day after I recorded my tape, I was informed that an initial move to the front side had taken place to Gibbs Crater, which is on the southeast rim of the near side of the moon. Since that time Soviet activity on the moon has been steadily increasing. As of now there are seven Soviet particle beam weapons dotted around the near side of the moon, and surprisingly there are three separate backup bases on the far side, including the original site at Jules Verne Crater. As yet all of these installations are very thinly manned, and they are far from being self-sufficient at this point. In order to keep functioning they must periodically receive supplies from Earth, but the Particle Beam weapons are operational, and if the normal Soviet pattern is followed, we can expect a test of a Moon-based Particle Beam weapon against some Earth target in the very near future, and if this is done it will probably take place under circumstances where its effects can be explained away as having some other cause. Possibly for the sake of secrecy, a target area within the Soviet Union far from populated areas will be chosen for such testing, but it's also possible that like the first operational test of an orbital particle beam weapon, the first test of a lunar particle beam weapon might be against some target that the Soviet Union wishes to destroy. In any case, here are the lunar navigational coordinates of the seven particle beam weapons currently on the near side of the moon. Number 1. East of the Sea of Cold at 55 degrees 54 minutes north, 51 degrees 0 minutes east. Number 2. West of the Sea of Crises at 16, 33 north, 48, 51 east. Number 3. Southeast of the Sea of Fertility at 31, 53 south, 73, 9 east. Number 4. Near the South Pole on the southwest side at 72, 26 south, 67, 30 west. Number 5. Near Phocylides Crater in the southwest quadrant at 50, 53 south, 57, 49 west. Number 6. Southwest of the Ocean of Storms at 9, 26 south, 66, 52 west. And Number 7 northeast of the Apollo 14 landing site near the center of the near side of the moon at 1, 23 south, 12, 27 west. The backup locations on the far side of the moon are at number 1, Jules Verne Crater, roughly 36 degrees south, 147 degrees east. Number 2, southeast of Pasteur Crater at 13, 36 south, 108, 26 east. 
No. 3, southwest of Compton Crater at 51 3 North, 95 0 East. The Soviet intentions toward us when Nuclear War I finally erupts are becoming all too clear, because as of November 10, 1977, I'm informed that Soviet agents are still at work throughout the United States mining additional targets for eventual destruction by remote control. One target area to which I believe I should call specific attention is the Kensico Reservoir just north of White Plains, New York. On September 21, 1977, two months ago, I was called by the FBI to ask for any information I could give them about the situation there. They had been tipped off that the Kensico Reservoir might be in danger in some way and wanted to know what I could tell them. I told them what I am telling you now, that there is a Soviet nuclear mine on the upstream side of the dam toward the east end. I also gave the FBI the locations of other Soviet nuclear devices in the area, such as one each in the south end of Pocantico Lake another in the east end of Terrytown Reservoir, and one in the Hudson River near the east end of the Tappan Zee Bridge. Whatever the FBI may have intended to do with this information, nothing has been done. The bombs are still there. It may well be that they were simply overtaken by events and their hands tied before they could do anything because it was only six days later, September 27, 1977, that America lost the Battle of the Harvest Moon, and Andre Gromyko delivered an ultimatum to Jimmy Carter for America to start towing the Soviet line. But whatever the reason, the FBI's concern over the Kensico Reservoir leads me to believe I should call special attention to it. Should the Kensico Reservoir be ruptured, the first victims would be the Holy Name School situated like the Tekoa Bible College in the shadow of the dam. But beyond that, flood waters from Kensico Reservoir would rampage through White Plains and on southward perhaps all the way to the North Bronx, New York City. The devastation and loss of life would almost certainly dwarf anything like had ever been seen in America. Yet no one is doing anything about it. A major insurance company learned recently from British intelligence about the situation at Kensico Reservoir and went to the New York City Police about it to no avail. Therefore apparently all I can do is to warn you. My friends, what I've said in AUDIO LETTER No. 24 for May 1977 I repeat again now. Behind the scenes maneuvering and trickery can lead only to disaster for America. Only total exposure of what is happening has any hope at all of turning the tide against utter catastrophe. I pledge to continue doing what I can toward this end, and I ask you to join with me in this very important effort. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless and protect each and every one of you.